Everybody's trying to get their message out these days, including your government. Hi, I'm Lynn Burmell. In this edition of It's Your Government, our very first edition, I'm proud to say, we explore the use of language by the people we pay to speak for us. So what's our message? It's your government. We go behind the headlines to bring you the stories you won't find anywhere else. Why use real words when you can use acronyms? Government speak at its finest. Our John Robson offers his quirky analysis. We also meet some of the scribes government hires to help in this high-tech communications age. And first, anyone up for a throne speech? If you watch the beginning of a throne speech, it's obvious that something is going on. People don't normally walk like this. They don't normally dress like this. And the ritual suggests some deep connection with our constitutional past. But what exactly is a throne speech? Jeff Norquay has been around Ottawa. He knows how the procedures work. A throne speech can be presented by a new government uh, when Parliament opens after an election, or it can be also presented by a government to kick off a new session within an existing parliament. In it, the government lays out its plan, its framework, the set of principles by which it will govern. Now, what isn't a throne speech on the other side? Um, it's not a budget. It's not a very specific catalogue of legislation. So it's more a set of propositions that outline the principles that will guide a government as it goes forward into the new parliament. It's really a narrative for the government. It's the government saying, here is our take on the main issues of the day, and here's the priority that we attach to these issues. Generally speaking, there will be a lead writer who takes the principal responsibility for sketching the broad outlines. There is a lot of interaction between that lead writer and the Prime Minister, obviously possibly other senior policy advisors in the office, perhaps the chief of staff, and also the clerk of the Privy Council or one of his or her key people will also take a look at the throne speech and add. I've been involved in a couple of throne speeches, the 1984, uh, the first throne speech presented by the Mulroney government and then the 1986. Some of them involved, you know, 30, 40 drafts. Do you ever hear back from the Governor General saying, gee, you know, I think I'd rather not read this paragraph, or would that be uh, really constitutionally improper? No, I think that would be um, outside the bounds of uh, constitutional practice in Canada. I think, generally speaking, um, the Governor General will read the throne speech as written. However, the convention is that the Prime Minister does meet quite regularly with the Governor General to advise him or her on the progress of the government and so the throne speech will not come as a great surprise to the governor general she will have she will probably have had a pretty good overview of the prime minister what's going to be in it we open the second session of the 39th parliament today One of the hazards in Ottawa, of course, is that you get too close to the process and lose perspective. So we asked a professional speechwriter and teacher of speechwriting, but one who's never herself written a throne speech, what she thinks of the genre. It embodies a long list of uh, things that the government hopes to do in the upcoming session of Parliament. So you have a, a very long list, and any time you have a speech built around a list, you've got a little problem in making it interesting. At the same time, you have to watch out for accidentally making it a little too interesting. As Jeff Norquay explains in this story about flying across the country with Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, about to sign off on the final version of the 1986 throne speech, 
which would announce three new regional economic development agencies, including the one for Atlantic Canada. Various names had come and gone through this uh, several week writing progr pro process and, and uh, I, I read the new name and I read a couple more pages and then I for some strange reason went back and read it again and found that we were about to establish the Atlantic Canada Development Corporation, the initials which were ACDC. So I underlined ACDC, passed it across the aisle to the Prime Minister and he said I think we'll come up with another name. And so that's how we got ACOA, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. It's nice to know that the throne speech is written in relatively plain language, and also that it was written reasonably competently. But in addition to knowing what it is and what it's not, it's important to understand what it used to be, a communication from the executive to the legislature, giving them advance warning of the laws they would be asked to debate, consider, and approve. If the legislature is to do its job of keeping an eye on the executive, it needs to be told ahead of time what's going to happen, not surprised, blindsided, and stampeded into approving things. Now, you don't want to get too nostalgic about the time when Victoria was on the throne, but the 2007 throne speech looks back to the 1957 throne speech, and if you look at that document, which you can do thanks to the Library of Parliament website that has them all, you will discover it's a very different document. In it, the Governor General, in fact the Queen in 1957 was in Canada and did give the throne speech, says, uh, my ministers propose to do certain things. You as parliamentarians will be asked to approve an increase of the old age allowance. You will be asked to provide funding for the Beechwood project in New Brunswick. And you'll notice there are two things there. One is these are very specific. So MPs have a chance to become informed about very specific things they'll be asked to give public money for. The other thing is the respectful tone, you will be asked. If you look at the 2007 throne speech, there's none of that. Wendy Cherwinski did spot one problem with this year's throne speech. If you introduce a theme, which they did, the theme of leadership, make sure to highlight, emphasize that theme early in the speech and then come back to it at the end. Uh, they, there was a lot of focus on the theme of leadership at the end of the speech that should have been uh, basically the second time the audience was hearing it so that it would reinforce it in their minds. The speech from the throne is an important moment in our country's democratic life. The 2007 throne speech says, revealingly though inaccurately, the throne speech is where the government communicates its vision to Canadians. That's not what it's meant to do. It's meant to communicate the executive's intentions to the legislature so the legislature can take a good hard look at them. This may seem pedantic. You may seem lost in constitutional minutiae. But if you're to control your government, it must be possible for your elected representatives to control the executive. That's how the separation of powers works or it doesn't work at all. So why should you care about this stuff? It's very simple. It's your government. <laughs> Even on the culture front, there are many Canadians creating that joint culture that we're all consuming. If you take a look at the number of Americans in Hollywood and New York, I think that you've got two countries that want to be and will be independent political structures. But its people and its commerce and its ideas are very, very integrated. And I, I don't see a threat in that. Yet many, many Canadians do. Unfortunately, we too narrowly define uh, what sovereignty is for our own benefit. This is an asymmetric relationship. There's no question they are 10 times larger on every score, population, economics, GDP, all of those things. And it doesn't mean that we're lesser. It just means that we're smaller. And I think we have to get over our own inferiority complex so that we can deal with this. Before email, hey even fax machines, this, driving, was the only way to get press releases trundled about town. Since those days, a vast communications industry, a kind of message machine, has blossomed in Ottawa. So how have government communications changed in light of the internet? Is it becoming a freeform platform of open debate? 
or is it still a one-way street? Mr. Speaker, the government will introduce bills to implement the measures in I'm Brian Hannington and I've been in Ottawa for about 20 years. I run a company called Stiff Sentences and we're a company of writers, actually formed originally in Nova Scotia. We came to Ottawa and became quite successful early on because we found here with the size of government and with the degree of activity being undertaken by government to communicate to the public, there was a huge need for good writing. I'm Ruth Cardinal, worked in 12 federal departments. I was head of communications for six of them and um, ended up my career with the top communications job in the federal government, which is assistant secretary to the cabinet for communications and consultation. I'm Joe Thornley. Uh, I'm the CEO of Thornley, Fallis and 76 Design. They're uh, sister companies that uh, provide communication services to organizations uh, and in particular what we specialize in is online and interactive communications. Kirsty, is Andrea here? Well, I think that the communications and writing industry in Ottawa, it's a funny industry, it's different from uh, that which exists in a city like Toronto. Here in Ottawa, uh, you get uh, smaller companies um, and you also have a cottage industry of former public officials and they work as individuals and still go back and work in government as contractors. You know when I tell young people today about the days before computers, before faxes, the communications business was really different. We'd do a news release if we wanted to get it into tomorrow's paper, it had to be with the journalist by 4 o'clock. So we would type it up. We had a fellow who would walk around the building to get the approvals of the various executives who needed to approve the news release. Then he would drive it over to the minister's office. Minister would make his or her changes, drive it back to us, and then we would print it and then he would drive around and deliver it to the various uh, media organizations and hopefully get it to them before deadline. There's no question in our minds as jobbers in the writing trade that the emergence of the internet has been the single most um, important evolution in communication in the last 20 years. <laughs> Federal departments now put most of their emphasis for their written products on their web sites. The public service is doing speeches overnight. Um, the 24-hour news cycle, you've got to have material all the time. You've got to be also ready to respond to the media very quickly because the news release goes uh, across the internet into a newsroom and within five minutes someone's calling you. the last few years something has come along called social media blogs and that has fascinated me and I've thrown myself into it pretty much completely. Social media is online communications uh, that allow me to actually write create video, create audio, post it to the uh, internet, share it with my friends, allow them to change it, allow them to comment on it. There's a great deal of fascination with the social media, with the blogosphere, with the um, discussion boards and chat rooms as alternate vehicles for information sharing blogs they have to be very interactive, they have to, have to be very current, so they're labor intensive. So you need to have staff all the time who can respond when people, uh, you know, communicate. If you have something that's written by an individual that has a bit of an individual style but communicates beautifully, use it. Allow the department to sound like Larry or Susie today 
because Larry and Susie have written something clear and human. And that actually nobody in the public minds if something sounds personal. 